you understand what this is? Well, after so much loneliness, it's good to be together. Welcome to this week's film show. Coming up, the Trolls continue their world tour and a new take on Renaissance master Michelangelo, both of those seen through the lens of our film critic Lisa Nesselson. But we're starting with a poetic and disquieting vision of the apocalypse in last words. The latest film from director Jonathan Nossiter, who joins me in the studio to tell us more. Hello, Jonathan. Morning. Now, your film, Last Words, is released this week in France. It was in the official selection at Cannes, but when that was cancelled, it was screened in Deauville instead. Now, just to recap, the film set in 2086. Its protagonists are some of the last people on Earth amid an environmental disaster, and some of them are suffering from a lethal respiratory disease, which... Feels very familiar and quite topical. Now, when you heard about COVID-19, what was your reaction as a filmmaker? And it a was a great teller? marketing coup for the film. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, it's, I, you know, I, I, the film is actually post-apocalyptic, so it's utopic. There's hope. Um, because the disasters have already come in the film. And I think that, that unfortunately, the absolutely catastrophic state of the planet and the damage that is irremediable that we're doing each day is going to lead... I, I, this, this is, these are not fantasies, this is scientific truth. Therefore, the question is, what do we do as human beings now? How do we react? And how will we react once the catastrophe has become greater? Uh, so unfortunately, I'm afraid COVID is a bit of an apparent, you know, it's, it's an aperitivo. It's a harbinger of things to come. OK, well, indeed, let's get a look at the film. Here's a taste of last words. It's been a long time since someone often reads, huh? <laughs> As we can see there, the film has a fantastic cast. You've got Nick Nolte and Stellan Skarsgård in that clip, but also Charlotte Rampling. And the central character is played by Kelly Touré, not yet a household name, was he a professional actor? No, absolutely not. Khalif, um, uh, you know, he's, holds his, he holds his own with Nick Nolte, Charlotte Rampling, Albert Orvacher, so on Skarsgård. Uh, I met him in a refugee camp in Palermo because to play the last person on earth, someone who sees the end of the world and doesn't lose courage, it occurred to me that rather than a young actor, I should try and see if there's a young African refugee who's already seen the end of the world in his tragic and, 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 and often lethal passage from Africa to Europe. And when I met Khalifa, I was astonished by his courage, his vitality, his, his lack of bitterness about the terrible things that he's already suffered. Uh, he was looking ahead, offering a positive feeling about what is possible despite disaster. And that seems to me the most important thing. It's really the heart of the film. I tried to give... I tried with these great actors and with Khalifa to propose an antidote to the Hollywood disaster film, something that looks at reality and then finds something positive and nonviolent and beautiful to look forward to. Yeah, he manages to capture a lot of wonder in his, in his eyes and in his acting. Now, the film suggests that both without culture and agriculture, because growth is important in this film, human existence is impoverished and doomed, essentially. You've been very involved in viticulture, I think, both uh, filming it for your 2004 documentary, Mondovino, and working in wine, too. So is that the ingredients for uh, a meaningful life, a good well, glass of wine and a, and a movie? <laughs> I would say also some nice tomatoes, since I've actually I've become a farmer. I live in Italy, and, and I grow tomatoes and other uh, heirloom vegetables uh, with a partner. And I think that... They, Civilization itself is based on two things. It's based on agriculture and culture. And without those, in, they're perhaps the two most abused things by cynical governments the world over. 
Um, and if COVID exists, it's because we don't invest in agriculture, healthy agriculture that's good for the planet and good for what people eat. We don't invest in public health and we don't invest in education. Culture in agriculture would give meaning and dignity to human existence. When they are destroyed, as they're being destroyed now, there is no more human society. Now, you're an American who's lived all over the world, based in Italy right now. Seen from Europe, do you think that American democracy has uh, the sort of fertile soil it needs so it can uh, flourish again? <laughs> no, I don't. I'm, in fact, I'm a Brazilian citizen, American citizen, and that means that I have two fascist presidents right now. Um, it is a source of incredible shame. Uh, and I'm afraid that in both countries, the outlook is not positive. Um, no matter what happens, I think that, that literally the soil of the spirit as well as the soil itself have been fatally poisoned. You know, whether, whether they can recover, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I hope so. But, it, but in, in, unless things change radically and not just getting rid of Bolsonaro and getting rid of Trump, they're not enough. I mean, everyone, if it happens, and let's pray that it does, will breathe a sigh of relief. But if we stop there, then we'll just go back to business as usual, mm -hmm. which is the beginning of the end of the world. Indeed, we're looking at a full cultural shift there and including in the arts. So let's move on to the new releases this week. And for that, Lisa Nesselson joins us to tell us first about animation juggernaut Trolls World Tour. Now, this came out on 637 screens, which is about one tenth of all available theatre screens here in France. But in the US, it was relegated mostly to video on demand, which did make a fortune very quickly for the studio. But this pivot to streaming, Lisa, do you think this is the death now for cinemas? So if they're relegated to the internet, does that make them internet trolls? Uh, the local distributor, United Pictures, Inter sorry, Universal Pictures International France, made a militant move to bring this out in theaters, and it looks as if that choice will be rewarded. As one of 13 new films to choose from last week, Trolls World Tour, with its eye-popping colors and fun range of animation techniques, had the second best opening day of any film this year in France. Tenet was the first. Disney, remember, decided to skip the big screen for Mulan and Soul, infuriating cinema odors and uh, disappointing a lot of moviegoers with no particular interest in subscribing to Disney's channel. Indeed, that again comes back to this streaming question. And Jonathan, one of your characters in the film unearths some celluloid reels as if they were buried treasure, remnants of another time. Is this how you see the movies? Dusty relics of another civilization? What about this shift to streaming? Look, I, I think there's no substitute. And part of what happens in the film, the joy of these people at the end of the world, discover that being together in the dark, looking up at a big screen and seeing an image larger than life brings joy and comfort even to people facing the worst. So I think there's no substitute for going to a movie theater and dreaming a dream in the dark with other people. It's going to be very hard for theater owners to survive what's happening. They were already very close to death all over the world. It's going to depend on how much the public decides that, that a communal experience as opposed to watching a tiny little image in your bed while you fall asleep or while you're cooking if there's a difference. But I, I would say it's a difference between imagining a love affair by Zoom and actually living one in real life. So Lisa, tell us a bit more about the story here. Well, Poppy and Branch and all their friends and neighbors love pop music, insisting that trolls just wanna have fun, but they abruptly must confront the hidden reality that there are other trolls in the universe, each community fueled by a string representing techno, funk, classical, country, and hard rock. Queen Barb of the Hard Rock Trolls is on the warpath to plunder all the strings and reassemble them into the ultimate power chord. Her goal is to make rock the only way anybody can roll. My favorite segment was with the fucking little piccolo, Penny Whistle, intent on rebuilding her former classical music paradise, Symphonyville. It sounds like a very rich universe, Lisa. Is this strictly for kids, this film? Well, it's a peppy barrage of zippy characters with winks and nods to grown-ups, and it seems to be embracing the trend of identity politics. Poppy's rationale for trying to unite the six groups with their six musical preferences is that we're all trolls, but other characters drawn as non-white, insofar as trolls can have racial characteristics, says, say things like, 
But we're not all the same. We have our own culture. Usually it's a male character who's too impulsive and doesn't listen. Uh, here it's Queen Poppy, who's a girl. And it's worth noting that a male troll gives birth to a tiny male troll and nobody bats a button. Okay. Okay. Well, next, moving on, incredibly accomplished Russian artist Andrei Konchalovsky turns his camera on an incredibly accomplished Italian artist in Il Peccato, which translates as sin. Uh, it's called Michelangelo, or Michelangelo, for the French release and the English release. Do tell us more, Lisa. I love this movie. We've all heard about the concept of having to suffer for one's art, but this is ridiculous. It turns out that aside from, say, Jeff Koons or Mick Jagger, it's rare to have a gift for both art an economic reality. Michelangelo is a genius when it comes to coaching beauty out of raw materials like marble, and kind of a dunce when it comes to budgeting his time and keeping greedy relatives at bay. We're in Florence, and it's the Renaissance, which was a very fine time to be a gifted painter or sculptor, or in Michelangelo's case, a boat. Two royal families, the Della Rovera and the Medici, wish to get his gifts under exclusive contract. Michelangelo sets his sights on a very big block of marble that he and the Carrara quarry workers he enlists call the monster. With pulleys and logs and human muscles and sinew, a bunch of men take a leap of faith that they can safely transport this sucker down a mountain. I was on the edge of the edge of my seat, holding my breath. Now, we've seen stories in film and TV before about tormented artists subject to impossible demands, but I've never seen a depiction of one man's great white whale as gripping as this. Konchalovsky achieves the goal of showing us how raw and barbaric the times were, and yet what sublime art arose in such daunting conditions. Indeed, nothing can stop a determined creative. Thank you very much for your insight this week, Lisa, and thank you, Jonathan, for joining us here in the studio. Now we'll leave you with a few years in the life of Michelangelo in Sin. Otherwise, do check out our website for more arts and culture and you can follow us on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. Per i puttanieri, tiranni e assassini. Volevo trovare Dio, ma ho trovato soltanto l'uomo.